When the absurdity of the modern video game scene becomes too much, I find it pleasant to step back into the comforting embrace of the retro. Once every seven or eight years, that means Final Fantasy VII. 90s-era JRPGs were among my first loves, and FF7 is always a good reminder as to why that was. It is, in many ways, far better than similar games that follow, especially with regard to its story and writing. It's just nice to see a game with a sincere story that doesn't rest on a convoluted cosmology or sequel baiting lore, that doesn't feature dialogue polluted with self-aware snark or desperate stabs at relevance. It's just something that makes you feel good once it's done. All that said, in other ways it is much worse than similar games that followed. JRPGs use a lot of plot devices and structures that are very dated, and FF7 leans into some of those hard. On my last playthrough, I kept a few notes on everything that didn't sit well with me in the presentation of the story, intending one day to tell the world what I would change. And as everyone is currently talking about Square Enix's latest efforts to milk this game for every cent left in it, now seems like the time to do that. My focus here is on the story of Final Fantasy VII. While I do have a few issues with the design as well, I won't be touching on that so much. And the way I see it, there are three top-level problems with the plot of Final Fantasy VII, or more precisely, how the plot is presented. First, most of the core plot of FF7 is condensed into a handful of plot dumps with episodic content between them. This can give the feeling that the plot is speeding up and then slowing down because so much time passes between key moments. Second is railroading. Now, for those not familiar with tabletop, railroading is the act of forcing the players to go somewhere they otherwise wouldn't go, usually by fabricating excuses to block off every possible alternative. Every linear RPG does this, but in FF7 there are several places where the player must take an action that the characters have absolutely no organic reason to do, and it can make the progression feel artificial. Finally, we have some world-building issues. The world of FF7 was greatly simplified for the purposes of gameplay, pretty common in a lot of video games. Now, this was meant to be expanded later, but that didn't exactly work out, and from a modern perspective, the world can feel a little thready. Naturally, none of these are issues unique to FF7. They're actually quite common in JRPGs of that era, and there are certainly far worse offenders caught across, but there are also games from this era that simply didn't have these problems, including some from Square. For my money, Final Fantasy VI, with its more character-focused plot, didn't have the same pacing issues. Now, I've devised a few models for fixing this game's plot, some of which are a lot more radical than others. One of my concepts involved writing Sephiroth out of the game entirely, but I had a feeling no one would really go for that one, though we will get into that just a little later. So instead, my approach here will be very safe, keeping the fundamental structure intact. At a top level, I do propose making some changes to the cast. For one thing, Red 13 can go. He doesn't have much of a connection to the plot, and despite his very unusual design, he's not a particularly interesting or even popular character, as far as I can tell, although I have a feeling that in a few hours I'm going to find out that I was wrong. But ditching Red would also free us up to add Yuffie and Vincent as standard characters. It never made sense to me that those two were secret characters. They're both very mechanically ordinary, completely different than the hidden characters in FF6, and both of them, and especially Vincent, are tied into the plot. Throw in that both have proven very popular among fans, as well as the devs tasked with turning this game into a series, just everybody loves them. There's no reason not to just have them as regular, mandatory party members. There's one more thing we should touch upon before getting into the actual script, and that is the compilation of Final Fantasy VII, hereafter referred to simply as the compilation. For those of you who've never heard of the compilation or have, like Square Enix, forgotten about it, the compilation was a collection of games and animated shorts set in the Final Fantasy VII universe, 
all built around the feature-length CGI film Advent Children. Now, these various media titles constitute an FF7 extended universe, developed mostly in the mid-late 2000s at a time when Square was teasing a full remake, while remaining standoffish about whether they were actually planning to do it. The compilation significantly changed the story of Final Fantasy VII in ways both major and minor, and it's a constant question as to whether those changes are canonical. Given that Square Enix ignored the compilation for so long, it's easy to assume that they're not. However, the recent re-release of Crisis Core, which probably retconned the core story more than any other part of the compilation, raises that question again. For my purposes, I will be assuming that everything in the compilation is non-canon. I will mention it a lot, mostly to talk about how the story has changed over time, but this video will assume that the only story is that that existed in the game's original release. And I think that's just about enough buildup, so let's get into the story proper. Believe it or not, the entire Midgar section is less than five hours of gameplay. It feels longer in part because it's become so iconic and is one of the things that everyone remembers, but also because it is one of the most fast-paced parts of the game. It's just hard to imagine that so much happens in such a short span of time. And this is certainly not the worst thing. Most JRPGs, and plot-driven video games in general, tend to be very deliberate in terms of their pacing. It makes it easier to get that requisite 40-plus hours of playtime. All things being equal, though, it's better for a story to have a pace that's too fast than too slow. I'm fine with learning almost everything about Eris within minutes of meeting her. I find it's better than having to get that information dribbled out over a third of the game, as many other titles would do. Even so, there are a few little tweaks I'd make here. Midgard could probably stand to be slightly longer, an hour, maybe two. There's just a lot that's underdeveloped here, particularly with regards to Shinra. We meet a lot of Shinra-linked characters in this section. The President, Rufus, Hojo, Scarlet, Heidegger, Reef, Palmer, Reno, Root, and Tsung. Most of them only get a few lines of dialogue, which isn't much to really establish them as characters. And be honest, how many of you actually remembered there even was a character called Palmer in Final Fantasy VII before I mentioned him? There are a few other small additions that will tie into changes I'll mention later. First, when Sector 7 is destroyed, Barrett's reaction is more pensive than angry. And second, we need to establish that Reeve is involved in internal intelligence, basically keeping tabs on other Shinra people to make sure that they're loyal. As long as we're touching up Midgar, we can also go ahead and just get rid of Don Corneo because... Oh, that has to be the single most uncomfortable part of the game. Now, this is going to complicate things later because I will be bringing Wu Tai into the game as a mandatory visit, and Corneo is the villain in that sequence in the original game. But we'll get to that a little later. Most of the proposed changes in my original notes come in the second five hours, basically the part between Midgar and Nibelheim. Now, this isn't exactly the most memorable part of the game for most people. However, it does appear to be the part of the game that Square Enix is remaking next, so this is kind of me trying to outmaneuver the actual developers. The section up until Junon is fine, and I only have one thing to change. You don't get Yuffie here, as again, she's now a standard party member and will be joining a little later on. Now, the story starts to diverge after Sephiroth appears aboard the Shinra ship. His attack on the ship damages it badly enough that it starts to take on water and the party is forced to abandon ship. As they retreat to an emergency vessel, Cloud spots Sephiroth on deck and, driven either by a reunion-esque supernatural impulse or just his own base instinct, splits off to fight him. During the clash, Sephiroth knocks Cloud into the water and the rest of his companions are unable to rescue him. I'll admit, that using a sinking ship or man overboard situation to split the party was a well-worn JRPG trope even back then. Square themselves had used a variant in both Final Fantasy IV and VI. In this case, though, it happens to make sense. I never understood how the ship could arrive safely at its intended destination, despite Sephiroth killing most of the crew and unleashing a monster below decks. It should have sank anyway. That fact is simply convenient to what I want to do. 
Anyway, Cloud regains consciousness on a beach, pulled from the surf by Yuffie. She tells Cloud that since he owes his life to her, he's now part of her crew and obliged to help her with a job, which turns out to be a robbery of Gold Saucer. Cloud has no loyalty to this girl, who as far as he knows is just a common thief, but he also has no clue where he is, so he goes along for the sake of convenience. Now, a quick aside before we get into Gold Saucer. I think a lot of Final Fantasy VII is best understood as symbolic or allegorical. This game isn't trying to be realistic, it's trying to leave an impression. Midgar is a very good example. Realistically speaking, the design of Midgar makes no sense, but as a visual metaphor, this literally stratified society with the elites living atop an underclass trapped with the city's pollution and detritus, it is very striking. And Gold Saucer works in much the same way. The architecture is nonsense, the location is absurd, but as a symbol of the grotesque wealth running through this world, it makes perfect sense, or rather, it would make perfect sense if it had more of a connection to Shinra. Gold Saucer feels like it should be a Shinra joint, but it's really just the obligatory JRPG Colosseum town, and has only a very forced connection back to the actual plot. Even the game makes fun of this, with Barrett asking rightly why it is that they are breaking off their hunt for Sephiroth to go to a casino resort. The real reason they're here is due to railroading. There's no plot reason to go to Gold Saucer. You have to go there because there's a patch of quicksand blocking your path and there's nowhere else to go. The means of crossing that quicksand is in Gold Saucer, but neither the player nor any of the characters know that, and there's no reason to assume it either. In my version, Gold Saucer is a Shinra resort, explicitly tied to the company. It's not only an additional means of making money, but also a way that Shinra keeps tabs on their employees. Shinra employees are encouraged to spend their holidays here, not knowing that the entire resort is monitored by Shinra personnel. The Shinra connection also gives Yuffie a reason to want to go there. Cloud assumes it's just a normal heist because he doesn't yet know about her anti-Shinra activities. In reality, Yuffie has some information suggesting that Gold Saucer contains a treasure trove of Shinra materia, perhaps even including a special materia, implying the existence of Meteor and or Holy hours before they are revealed. The involvement of Shinra would also explain why there would be a Shinra spy here. Since there's no reason why the party would need to go to Gold Saucer, there's also no reason why Reeve and the guide of Kate Sith would be waiting for them here. On the other hand, if Shinra owned Gold Saucer and Reeve is established as a kind of internal spy, it flows a lot better. Kate Sith is here to monitor the patrons. He recognizes Cloud, as anyone in Shinra would at this point, and finds an excuse to tag along. Rather than going to Coral Dungeon, there is a short dungeon inside Gold Saucer. Cloud et al. find evidence of Shinra's monitoring, and possibly the Keystone, which Yuffie ignores since it isn't materia and doesn't look valuable. But they don't find the massive materia stash that Yuffie assumed was there. However, they do find information pointing to an alternate route to Nibelheim via Cosmo Canyon and set off in that direction, aided by an appropriated Shinra buggy. As this is going on, the rest of the party, which if you've forgotten would be Tifa, Eris, and Barrett, because Red 13 is not in my script, arrive at a town somewhat off their original course. Had the voyage been less eventful, the Shinra ship would have landed somewhere much closer to Nibelheim and Rocket Town, but now the second group has to take a longer route through the mountains, which will ultimately result in the meeting up with Cloud and his new group. Along the way, they pass through North Coral. It's not right outside of Gold Saucer this time, which never made a lot of sense to me. I don't know why Shinra would have any patience for a shanty town at the entrance of their opulent resort. Rather, it's on an easily missed mountain pass leading to Gold Saucer. This is the start of Barrett's character arc, and while it is fundamentally the same as in the original script, there are some changes meant to redeem the game's most mocked character. The original account of Coral had some gaps in it that seemed to exist mainly just to make Shinra look more evil. Why exactly did Scarlet have Coral torched when the people there were giving Shinra everything they wanted? The original script offers no explanation other than the bad guys being the bad guys. There are better explanations for the crisis that befell Coral. 
A disaster at the Mako reactor is sensible, but a more interesting alternative is that Shinra still torched the town, but this time Barrett was vocally against their presence. He organized some sort of protest, maybe a strike, presumably the locals were working on the reactor project. Shinra moves to put it down, and Barrett was injured in the fighting while the others died. As a result, he suffers from a wicked case of survivor's guilt as he was the one who lived despite the resistance being his idea. This is why Barrett had a more somber reaction to watching the destruction of the slums back in Midgar. It was history repeating itself. Once again, Barrett has invoked the wrath of Shinra only to survive that wrath where many others have perished. Now, since the release of Final Fantasy VII, many people have commented on a very plain fact. Barrett is a terrorist. Even the game acknowledges, in a throwaway line that is never explored after Barrett says it, that his attacks on the Midgar reactors killed people, and not just Shinra Stooges either. The game takes a real greater good angle here, but even so, it's hard to just move beyond the fact that many, many innocent people have died, either directly or indirectly, as a result of Barrett's actions. This, then, is the start of Barrett's redemption arc, one that might just elevate him beyond being the angry black man with a gun for an arm. It begins with him acknowledging the violence that follows him. The two groups are finally reunited shortly before arriving in Cosmo Canyon. Now, I'm going to level with you here. I hate Cosmo Canyon. My original notes called for excising it entirely, and here's a short list of reasons why. One, the connection to the plot is tenuous. Cosmo Canyon exists primarily to contain what passes for Red's arc, which is introduced and concluded here. This is another reason why I wanted to write him out. He is simply such a flat character in as much as all of his development can be contained in one dungeon. Absent Red, there's no reason for this place to exist, especially because, two, Gungaga serves the same purpose. I really don't understand why Gungaga is an optional area. It arguably contains more of the plot, at least as far as Tifa is concerned. It shows off the environmental damage that Shinra is causing in a much more elegant way than just having Bugenhagen drop another plot dump. And the presence of high-level Shinra personnel hints at something deeper going on in Shinra. So why is this area not just optional, but easily missable? Three, Cosmo Canyon has the worst railroading in the entire game. Now, I realize most of you don't actually know how the game gates off Nibelheim, given that as RPG aficionados, you instinctively stop at every town to buy upgrades, and doing that here locks you into Red's story. Well, here it is. If you try to pass Cosmo Canyon, the buggy abruptly stops working with no explanation. I don't know why people still make fun of the king in the first Final Fantasy building a bridge in your honor when this is so much worse. The sensible solution would have been to put Cosmo Canyon at the end of the canyon and make the Cave of the Gi a passage through to Nibelheim, so I don't know why they didn't do that. And point four, Cave of the Gi is an atrocity of a dungeon. I mean, that's more of a gameplay issue though, so we'll just set that aside. So yeah, Cosmo Canyon sucks. Nevertheless, in the name of keeping Final Fantasy VII's essential structure intact, I have opted to keep Cosmo Canyon around but this time it serves a different story purpose. Cosmo Canyon is now on a mountain with a single passage leading to Nibelheim and the entrance controlled by Bugenhagen. Initially, Bugenhagen doesn't want to let Cloud and his friends through, but he eventually relents once he concludes that their mission is just. At this point, he dumps out all the information about the live stream and Mako reactors. Cosmo Canyon is still part of someone's arc, but this time it's Barrett. Up until this point, everyone knows that Mako reactors are potentially dangerous, but no one was aware that they threatened the entire planet. Bugenhagen's explanation as to how they really work adds an additional layer to Barrett's actions, moving him from vindictive terrorist to potentially protector of the entire world. In doing this, Bugenhagen doesn't absolve Barrett for all the deaths he's caused. Rather, he offers Barrett some clarity. You've done awful things for all the right reasons, so what are you going to do next? All of this continues Barrett's redemption arc, one that doesn't conclude until much later when he saves North Coral, proving that he can protect life as well as end it. Now before we move on to Nibelheim and the second of the maybe three parts of this game people actually remember, I want to double back and talk about Sephiroth. 
Sephiroth has become a surprisingly divisive character among RPG enthusiasts. Some people like him a little too much, some hate him entirely too much. A lot of the grief that people heap on Sephiroth is wholly undeserved, most of it stemming not from Final Fantasy VII itself, but from what happened in video games in the years following its release. Yeah, the evil Bishy became a heinous trope after this, but as I find myself telling young writers on a regular basis, a cliché is not a bad idea, it's an overused idea, and often it has become overused because it is, or was, a very good idea. Sephiroth is a brilliantly designed character who became iconic for a reason. That's not the problem. The problem is, he is not the right villain for the story. A lot of recent critics have argued for FF7 as some kind of pro-environmentalist or even anti-capitalist story. These people are wrong. Now, it's possible, even likely, that this is what the writers intended, but all of that changes once Sephiroth is introduced at the end of the Midgar sequence. Before that, the bad guys are all affiliated with Shinra, and there's a clear political angle to the story. But after the Nibelheim flashback, the Shinra people are demoted to minor figures in Sephiroth's story, taking any socio-political content with them. Sephiroth's goal is ultimately to destroy the planet. Destroying and or ruling the world was the stock standard motivation for villains in JRPGs and video games in general up until this point. As a result, the plot of FF7 becomes far more conventional than it would have been had the members of Shinra remained the chief antagonists. Sephiroth isn't a bad villain by any stretch, but he's the wrong villain for the cutting-edge story the writers wanted to tell. The funny part is that while excising Sephiroth would remove most of the game's more iconic moments, it wouldn't actually change the central plot all that much. Genova could still stay in the story, which means that the reunion, or something very similar to it, could still happen. The apocalyptic end games could still happen as well, with a few tweaks, attributing more importance to the promised land and the release of the weapons, for example. On the other hand, Keeping Sephiroth in opens up avenues to complicate the plot in interesting ways. The fact that Sephiroth wants to destroy the world makes him an enemy of Shinra as well as Cloud and his people. This could have set the stage for a more complex mid-game, with an uneasy truce forming between Shinra and Cloud's group. This is something that would be distasteful for many of the characters and could lead to some serious gray areas if Cloud and company had to overlook Shinra's misdeeds. Ultimately, I've opted to keep Sephiroth where he is for the sake of coherency, but he was miscast. Despite his grandiosity, I feel that he'd be a much better fit for a more intimate, character-driven story. Alright, back to the story proper. So where were we? Nibelheim? Alright. So Cloud's return to Nibelheim is one of the major hinge moments of the game's narrative. Before this, Cloud is treated as a reliable narrator, with his memories of Sephiroth being fragmentary, but essentially correct. It's here that all of this starts to break down, and Cloud's neat narrative phrase at the ends, opening up the possibility that everything we've known is wrong. Nibelheim doesn't need any serious narrative repair, every element does its job as intended. As with Midgard, though, Nibelheim could probably benefit from being expanded a bit. This seems to be the approach that Square Enix has taken over the years anyway, with the town, the reactor, and especially the mansion getting larger. I tend to agree that this is the best approach. For my purposes, the only wrinkle here is how we bring Vincent into the equation now that he's a standard party member. Perhaps the least surprising aspect of Square Enix's marketing blitz for the new game is how much attention it throws on Vincent. He was already a popular character when FF7 was new, and he remains one of the more beloved figures from the story, equaling if not surpassing Cloud and Sephiroth. Vincent is also one of the few elements of the story that got significant attention in the compilation. Now, one thing that was explored there, albeit in a fairly shallow way, was a closer connection between Cloud and Vincent, and this is something I would like to lean into in my rewrite. The Shinra Mansion is now a mandatory dungeon, one that Cloud insists on exploring because he remembers Sephiroth spending a lot of time there, but also because he feels compelled to do so. Vincent is still entombed in one of the labs underneath the mansion, but this time he's much less eager to join up. He's disoriented upon waking, but doesn't seem to particularly care that Cloud et al. are present, 
and begins to roam the mansion and laboratory on his own. Throughout the dungeon, the party occasionally runs into Vincent, and he and Cloud converse briefly. They quickly learn that both were highly placed members of Shinra, though Vincent points out some inconsistencies in Cloud's story, noting, for example, that there aren't a lot of people who reach Soldier First Class, and he'd never heard of one named Cloud Strife. Vincent believes Cloud a little more after learning that Cloud is familiar with Hojo. It's at this point that Vincent asks about Lucretia. Cloud doesn't recognize the name, and it hasn't appeared in the story yet, but Vincent offers to aid Cloud and the party in exchange for their assistance later on. The group is obviously a little bit suspicious about the man affiliated with the Turks who popped out of a coffin, but Cloud talks them into bringing him along. This situation establishes a relationship between Cloud and Vincent that has a fair amount of friction. Each is in a position to help the other, but each also has reason to believe that the other is lying to him. It's sort of odd that there wasn't more of this kind of tension as Square employed it in previous games, such as with Tella and Gilbert in FF4, or Cyan and Celia's in FF6. Now here, we're gonna split the party again. Sephiroth's trail has gone cold, with few clues as to where he might go next. Yuffie chimes in, insisting that they need to go chat with her old master in Wu Tai, as she claims he may know something, while also insisting that Cloud still owes her for saving him. With nothing else to go on, half the party accompanies Yuffie back to Wu Tai, while the rest scout the surrounding area for anyone who might have made contact with Sephiroth. The area after Nibelheim is another bit of railroading. As there's no particular reason to visit Rocket Town, except it's an RPG and you have money from the last dungeon that you want to spend. We're certainly not getting rid of it though, as Rocket Town is home to my personal favorite character from this game, Sid Highwind. Sid bucks a lot of video game cliches. 90s era JRPGs were notorious for featuring absurdly young characters, and video games in general have always attempted to add depth to characters by giving them dark and tragic secrets that they hide at all costs. Sid, meanwhile, is just an overt crank. He's a jaded older man, relatively speaking, at 32 he's middle-aged by the Logan's Run standards under which these games operate, and he is eager to expound at great length about all of the people who ruined his dreams. This prickliness could have made Sid deeply unlikable, but instead it humanizes him. He comes across as far more relatable than the anime stereotypes that tended to populate games at the time. There is one problem with Sid, though. He is far too eager to hitch his dreams to Cloud. Like every other playable character, Sid hates Shinra. But unlike every other playable character, he hates Shinra for not doing enough. Sid doesn't want to take Shinra down. If anything, he wants them to prosper so they might have resources to put back into their space program. And Rufus wanting to use Sid's plane, which was already a dodgy plot point as Shinra clearly has airships, doesn't seem like enough of a shove to make him abandon his last hope. Sid has no reason to suspect the party right away. He is a part of Shinra, but only a very small part of a forgotten program existing only in a remote, unimportant part of the world. There's no reason Sid would know about Cloud, Avalanche, or anything happening in Midgar. However, it wouldn't take too much conversation to figure it out, and once Sid knows the score, he's no longer inclined to help them. But Sid has reason for hope. There's an unusually large security presence in Rocket Town, which means that someone important is visiting, and the only reason anyone important would visit Rocket Town is to restart the program. Since he's about to realize his dreams, Sid isn't going to rock the boat. Alas, the visitor turns out to be Palmer delivering notification that the space program is dead and the rocket is being decommissioned. Hearing the news, Sid snaps and fights his way through the Shinra security personnel in an attempt to stop Palmer's machines from taking the rocket apart. From here, things proceed as they did originally. Sid and the party escape in the tiny Bronco, Shinra security shoots it down, and Sid joins with the party in search of retribution. They do have a new destination. They're headed to Wutai to pick up their allies. Now, Wutai is perhaps the most underutilized element in Final Fantasy VII. It could have been just the obligatory East Asian-themed town, but Square actually infused the place with a lot of interesting socio-political elements recalling Polynesia in the 18th and 19th centuries and the fate of Japan after World War II. 
They then proceeded to immediately squander this by using Wu Tai as the backdrop for a comedic side quest featuring Don Corneo, one of the most nauseating characters in video game history. Now, from a late 90s perspective, you can forgive all of this. After all, Yuffie was an optional character who was very easy to miss, meaning that Wu Tai was going to be just another shopping destination for most people. So why bother with a really detailed and interesting side story if almost no one sees it? Of course, Yuffie didn't stay a secret for long. By the month after the game's release, every magazine and website had a guide for unlocking the bonus characters, and in the years since, Yuffie has turned into a fan-favorite character. She was a significant focus of the compilation, and yet Wu Tai is still this vague smudge that people only remember as being Yuffie's home, or there was apparently some war that no one felt the need to describe in detail. So we're going to realize Wu Tai's full potential by making it a mandatory location. And first, we're dropping that war nonsense. Wu Tai's state is the result of their avoiding conflict. Wu Tai was originally very isolated, but they slowly came into contact with Shinra due to the proximity of Shinra's shipping lanes. As friction built between the two, the city had a choice. Resist Shinra or appease them. Ultimately, those in favor of appeasement won, and Wu Tai began making concessions. They began as a de facto service port for Shinra, but as Shinra built up its own infrastructure, Wu Tai lost its logistical importance and was forced to become the giant tourist trap that it is during the game's time frame. This makes Wu Tai an interesting contrast to Coral. Coral resisted and was raised to the ground. Wu Tai capitulated and is still physically present, but they've lost their identity and their way of life. There is still a secret resistance in Wu Tai, headed up by Yuffie's master Goro. Goro concluded from studying Shinra that much of their power comes from their use of materia, and Wu Tai could have a fighting chance if they had materia as well. He sends Yuffie on a mission to steal materia, a classic element of both espionage and asymmetrical warfare, as stealing an enemy's arm strengthens the good guys and weakens the bad. The group arrives on the island by sneaking aboard a Shinra cargo ship. Not far outside of the port, they run into a suspiciously strong Shinra security presence. As in the original game, Yuffie robs the party and runs, leading them to Wu Tai. Shinra has a very strong presence in Wu Tai, including all of the Turks, not just the three who were there in the original game, but Zung as well. Now, as with most ancillary Shinra members, Zung is pretty underdeveloped, but he is clearly more pragmatic than most of the Shinra people. He's very terse, avoiding any discussion of why the Turks are even there, but he makes it clear that Shinra views Sephiroth as a far bigger problem than Avalanche. Then Tsung makes an offer. Cloud's people stay out of Shinra's way, and the two sides leave each other alone. Part of that deal means departing Wu Tai and leaving Yuffie to the Turks, implying that they know who she is and that she's a problem for them. Perhaps not eager to trust the head of the Turks, Cloud turns Shinra's offer down and thus begins a race between the two groups to capture Yuffie first. After various shenanigans, this culminates in Cloud rescuing Yuffie from the Turks. She claims that she only stole the party's materia so that they'd follow her, and deciding whether this flimsy excuse is true is an exercise for the player, and then she brings them to speak with Goro. With Shinra bearing down on them, Goro keeps it simple. He thinks he knows where both Sephiroth and Shinra are headed. He hands over part of the keystone, explaining that it's the secret to accessing the Temple of the Ancients, a place said to hold a particularly powerful materia. However, the keystone is broken and he only has half of it. Recognizing the stone, Yuffie announces that the other half is in a vault back in Gold Saucer. Cloud et al. fleed from the Shinra forces just in time to spot the tiny Bronco coming to their rescue. They all escape together and head back to Gold Saucer, but not without wondering why Shinra had such a heavy presence in these backwater towns. First off, it would be rude of me to remove the dating subplot. Yes, people have been known to make fun of it. I might have been known to make fun of it. However, dating sim-like mechanics have become increasingly common in RPGs over the last few years, so it really seems like Square was a quarter century ahead of the curve here. What I am going to do is tweak this plot point to remove the story's dependence on serendipity, in this case a well-timed tram failure. Cloud and the party return to the Gold Saucer and work up a plan to recover the other part of the Keystone. Vincent proposes that he does this alone. He is technically still a member of the Turks, which gives him easy access, and if stealth is needed, then it's easier to sneak around by himself. 
not everyone is immediately on board with this. Vincent is a shady figure to begin with, and their recent unexpected run-ins with Shinra's security have led everyone to believe that there is a spy among them. Nevertheless, everyone goes along, letting Vincent do the dirty work while the rest enjoy a day off and try to blend in with the tourists. When Cloud and whomever he was with return to the hotel, they find Vincent incapacitated and both pieces of the keystone gone. A furious Cloud accuses Vincent of betraying them until one of the other party members spots Kate Sith fleeing the scene. As with the original game, they catch up to Kate Sith just in time to watch him hand over the keystone, leaving them all facing down a big group of Shinra security and a major decision. Here, we need to talk about Reeve, who got a fair amount of attention in the compilation, but was pretty underdeveloped in the original game. In my version, Reeve is a bit of an idealist, but also thoroughly grounded. As he traveled with Cloud and the others, he concluded that they really didn't have a chance of stopping Sephiroth, and wanted them to back down for their own good. He was responsible for the small armies present in Rocket Town and Wutai, as well as Sung's involvement, and was really hoping that this would be enough to discourage them. Reeve slash Kate Sith repeats Sung's offer. Cloud and his team quit chasing Sephiroth and Shinra will let them go. The fact that they are currently in a Shinra-run facility surrounded by security personnel is an extra incentive. The only choices are compliance or death. Cloud rejects the offer again, and they fight their way out of the Gold Saucer, temporarily ditching Kate Sith in the process. With no means of access in the Temple of the Ancients on their own, their only hope is that Shinra will lead them to the temple, and ultimately, Sephiroth. I'd like to conclude this by following up on something I said earlier. Now, I said that Final Fantasy VII is best understood as allegory, that many of its iconic locations make more sense as visual metaphors than as actual real-world locations. But really, when you consider how the story unfolds, it's even broader than that. All three of the PSX Final Fantasy games are very visual, more so than the rest of the series in my opinion. This was Square taking advantage of new 3D rendering technology to tell these stories through geography and gestures that just weren't possible on older hardware. Final Fantasy VII is the most pronounced of the three, featuring some of the most gorgeously detailed background art in video game history contrasted with what is, after a lot of study for this, a fairly skimpy script. Final Fantasy VII was an experiment in what these days we'd call environmental storytelling, putting the story across through anything other than text. In doing so, they demonstrated both the potential and the limitations of this approach. Put simply, most of the problems I've identified could have been fixed simply by having the characters talk a little more. You can really see this when you compare Final Fantasy VII with Final Fantasy VIII. My opinion is that the latter game has a much weaker story and a less interesting world than FF7. However, it also has fewer story gaps than FF7 because Squared refined their new approach to storytelling. Now admittedly, I'm not a neutral observer here. I'm a dialogue writer by nature. I feel that when you're telling a story about humans, a social animal, it is appropriate and wise to include the primary means by which humans socialize. And in recent years, I've become increasingly resentful towards some of these games as art types who insist that dialogue is for idiots and that the best stories need to forego it entirely. Yeah, there's a lot you can do with environment, but if you're gonna go all in with environmental storytelling, then you're going to run into problems with anything but an extremely basic story. Whether you're dealing with complex world building with a sophisticated culture and history, or the Byzantine relationships between characters, there are points where you need a narrative, and a clear narrative needs words. Final Fantasy VII probably could have benefited from having a couple more words to go along with its fantastic music, backgrounds, and character design. 